Well, uh, welcome again for these uh, chats. This is the first one we are doing in English, and this is because we have the, the, the honor of having a guest as we have today. We are with uh, our friend and colleague, the Professor Henry Giroux, one of the most important voices of critical pedagogy in the history, I would say. So uh, we have the great honor of, of having him in this space. We are, um, as we know, with, with Paulo Rivera of um, Esbrina Group and the University of Barcelona. And um, first of all, thank you very much, Henry, for, for sharing this space. And well, first, just to, to ask you, and then we go just deep into uh, our, our thoughts and our reflections of all these things. How are you doing? Where are you? And how are you living this, uh, this phase of uh, this historical, historically uh, moment in our lives? It's very strange, right? I mean, it, it, it's very interesting because it, it gives the notion of crisis a new meaning. Yeah. I mean, this, this is a crisis that isn't hidden in the cracks. It doesn't hide behind the walls of nationalism. It, you know, it, it doesn't hide somewhere in the lower reaches of Africa or the southern parts of, of Italy. I mean, it's, it's a global crisis that bears down on us in a way that seems to speak to a contradiction. And I'll, then I'll, I'll answer your question more directly. I mean, yeah. And that contradiction is at one level, it calls for social isolation as a, as a medical prescription for fighting, the, for fighting the pandemic. At another level, social, social isolation is endemic to a system that absolutely oppresses people. <laughs> it, it atomizes them, it isolates them, it tells them they, they have to bear complete responsibility individually for all the problems that they face. And so there's this tension between, on one level, a medical language that really does have a moral compass because it wants to save lives. Yeah. And a political question on the other side that basically is at odds with saving lives <laughs> and, it, and, and is really about imposing the worst forms of precarity and anxiety and exploitation. So I find myself in a very interesting place. I'm at home uh, in my study where I do all my work and most of my work, and, uh, and yet I feel connected, but I feel isolated in a, in a very profound yeah. way. I mean, it, it's not a cheerful isolation because I have no control over it. And it's an isolation imposed in, in the name of life, but it's a, an isolation not un, unconnected to the machineries of death. And so we we're in a very strange place to develop a vocabulary to try to figure out how this is not just a, a medical crisis, but a political crisis and a moral crisis and a pedagogical crisis, to say the least. Uh, so so I'm, I'm at home trying to figure this all out. Uh, you know, whether I do it successfully or not is another question. But it's, uh, for me, it, it, it makes me realize so profoundly how much we need each other, you know, not, not just in terms of our camaraderie around politics, but we need each other in terms of being able to connect to bodies, you know, to real human beings. I mean, to, you know, to have love in our lives, to materialize this stuff. I mean, we live in an age of virtual existence and all of a sudden being forced to be in that age exclusively for those of us who are privileged to have computers and all this other stuff, we, we, we're being reminded rather harshly uh, how much we need other people beyond visual screens and how much we need to resurrect the notion of community and justice. Uh, so, you know, that's where I am. Uh, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to work with. Um, Henry, uh, thank you for your, your presentation and your introduction because uh, you know, you have a, a very intensive activity, intellectual activity in this lockdown process, no? You published two very interesting articles, uh, but in the same line that you worked the last year, no? About the, the phenomenon of the neoliberalism phenomenon, no? Uh, 
And one of the one of you, the, this, these two articles say that the name is uh, entitled, sorry, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is an exposing to plaque of neoliberalism. And the, the first two lines say, the current coronavirus pandemic is more than a medical crisis. It is also a political and ideological crisis. I would like to understand what is your position about this crisis. Why do you think that this is a, a ideological crisis and how this connect with the neoliberalism? Well, it, it, it's, it's an ideological crisis because it's a crisis that in, in a very fundamental way uh, has a narrative about what matters and what doesn't in a society. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ideological crisis because when we look at the way in which that crisis unfolded, it unfolds within relations of power. It doesn't unfold as an invasion of a germ that comes into countries and that all of a sudden you have to deal with. It unfolds in the history of a country that has certain priorities about what it means to deal with questions of public health, what it means to have resources available that in some way protect people's lives, what it means to have a welfare state in place that can provide adequate health to people so that they can be tested immediately, so that people who were poor don't have to worry about, for instance, in the United States, going to an emergency room to get tested, knowing that they can't afford it, and hence become a threat in some way to the existing community. But the real question here is not to paint people who in that ideological political narrative have been excluded as a threat. The real question here is what's the relationship between this pandemic and human rights? Hmm. And human rights. So it's not, it's, not a, it's not a matter of saying poor people are a threat. It's not a matter of saying the homeless are a threat because they can get infected and spread the disease everywhere. It's a matter of saying, what has the state done to basically address this pandemic as not just simply a medical problem, but as a matter of human rights, as a, as a matter of making sure that people will be protected. What, how is the state defining itself as something other than a market-driven phenomenon? How do, how do relations between people get defined outside of commercial relations? How does something other than consumption define who we are as citizens? How, would we, how do we resurrect the notion of community so that we can work together in some fundamental way to make sure this never happens again. That this, this, this basically, you will not have lead, uh, uh, you, you will not have relations of power, you will not have economic interest, you will not have insane neoliberal politicians who are more concerned about the stock market and hence will provide lies about the very nature of the crisis to make sure the stock market is stable than basically informing people about the truth. So it seems to me that this is not only a, uh, a medical crisis, it's a political crisis in that it, it goes right to the heart of how relations of power are, are being abused, how they've been abused for the last 40 years, and how we now find ourselves in a neoliberal system that basically is incapable of dealing with, with, with uh, what I would call social needs, dealing with issues that basically are outside of the kinds of protections that the market can provide. So as an ideological crisis, there's one other issue, and that's the pedagogical issue. And that issue is, you know, what, what goes on in a country pedagogically that enables people to basically become critical agents and to think not only individually, but socially, in terms of the power that they have, the rights that they have, and what it means in some fundamental way to be able to act collectively in their own best interest. When you have a media controlled basically by commercial interest, when you have right-wing media constantly pushing out drivel and conspiracy theories, you have an ecological educational system, an ecosystem, a pedagogical ecosystem that is not on the side of truth, it's not on the side of evidence, it's on the sides of falsehoods. It's on the sides of fake news. It's on the side of lies. And it seems to me this undermines the fabric of a social and democratic society in profoundly tyrannical ways. Yeah, I think that uh, a great image of what you are saying, uh, Henry, I don't know if you agree, is that um, how many days or hours, let's say, that the, the media 
uh, started talking about economics after talking about the pandemic in a health way, right? Absolutely. Um, I think that we are facing all the time news that are talking about the health because we have the problem. Uh, they are obligated to do it, but uh, w when you scroll down a, just a little bit in, in the media, they are all the time asking of which are the economic problems of this crisis. Uh, and no, we are I, all the I, time I, uh, being forced to, to think how the markets are going to, to, to build again after the crisis. Uh, I, I completely agree with you. And I, and, I, and, I, and I actually think there's something very sinister that has emerged in this contradiction between an emphasis on profits as opposed to an emphasis on human needs and on public health um, and on social justice and human rights. I mean, to hear politicians in these various countries, I'm not sure about Spain, but I, I, I can certainly speak to what I've heard in the UK from Boris Johnson and a number of his ministers initially, and certainly in the United States, uh, ongoing, it hasn't stopped where people are talking about herd immunity and they're talking about how the economic system above all has to survive. And at the same time, they make a defense for people dying who are considered disposable, whether they're the elderly, whether they're the poor, whether they're the sick, whether they're people who have pre-existing conditions. I mean, this is the most flagrant violation of human rights that I have heard from politicians since the 1930s. This is not only a form of social Darwinism that's now being justified in the name of economic rights. No, I'm sorry, not economic rights, economic privilege, excuse me, yes, right? Yes, economic yes, yes. privilege, right? That's being justified in the name of economic privilege, but it's also a philosophy that makes clear and visible once and for all that they believe that economic activities should be removed from social cost. These people live in a moral vacuum. They, they produce policies, they enact practices, they promote values that are on the side of death. This is a machinery of death. And now it justifies itself by making an appeal to not just simply social Darwinism, but to eugenicism that we saw in the 1920s and the 1930s. Let's be honest, this is racial cleansing. This is social cleansing. This is class cleansing. This is not about saving the economy exclusively. That's complete bullshit. It goes far beyond that, but you can't understand that unless you can link this crisis to a larger set of ideological assumptions and, and relations of power. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, of course. Um, it's crazy. I, I don't. I, I would like to 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 tell you when you do see the television, for example, and there are may may no, I don't know a thousand people uh, in a demonstration in the U.S. with uh, fight for the right to go to the, for example, to the to work, for, to go to the beach, to go to the we'll supermarket, to go. Yeah, I don't know what what is your opinion about this phenomenon because here in Spain and including Chile, this is a little bit crazy, you know. I, I mean, I'll tell you, I have, I I, I want to complicate that issue, okay, and I want to begin <laughs> with the most obvious response, and that is, you have right wing extremists, neo Nazis, militia groups, who are convinced that the government is the enemy of justice. They've been told that for the last 40 years, that all the, the only role the government can play is to take away their guns. And so the government is evil, right? This is a central element of neoliberal ideology. No. Uh, and it basically, underlying that assumption is an attack on the welfare state, the demonization of immigrants, a kind of racial hatred, uh, the hatred of those who are not white, who occupy a public space known as Americana, or other, a, 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 a kind of misleading version of Disneyland. That's one option. A very extremist ideology operates in the language of violence and it operates in the language of self-interest that is completely at odds with any notion of democratic community and democratic values. Then there's another issue. 
And the other issue is you have people starving. You have people who don't have incomes. You have people who have lost their jobs. You have people who have families. They, they live from paycheck to paycheck. They've been out of work for five weeks. They have no language. They don't have a language that can enable them to say, this isn't about freedom versus the government. This is about a government that's failed. This is about a government that's failed. That's what this is about. That dichotomy is false. It's a false dichotomy uh, in the more general sense. The real issue here is that people should be in the midst of this crisis, have the funds, have the free health care, have the services available to them until this crisis is over. This is a crisis of inequality, massive inequality. Oh, it's a crisis oh. of greed. It's a crisis of structural inequality. It's a crisis of structural injustice. So to simply frame this as neo-Nazis versus sane people is only partly true because it then misses the largest, larger issue. Henry, now that you are talking about language, I, I read in, the, in, in your last articles that you were talking about the language of war and the consequences of the militarization of not only language, but public places and also our bodies, no? Yeah. Um, do you think are we being pushed into a massive surveillance life? Oh, I, I, I think yeah. that, you know, I, 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 think there are, I think we've got to be very, very attentive to the way in which the state, in the name of a medical option, and uh, a, a medical prescription, <laughs> is enhancing its power of surveillance. Surveillance can be, in the wrong hands is enormously dangerous. And it also has a tendency to be in the wrong hands. <laughs> it doesn't have a tendency to work in the interest, generally speaking, of, of justice. But we're also seeing an attack on journalists all over the world. We're seeing an attack in South Africa. They're criminalizing dissent. They're saying anybody who speaks about the pandemic uh, in terms that criticizes the government can go to jail. Turkey is, is it, the, the, the government of Hungary is issuing laws saying things like, I'm sorry, in India, Modi in India just is trying to pass legislation which saying you, can, you can't say anything negative about the government during the pandemic crisis. It has to be positive, you know? Then you have the general public saying things like, oh, you can't be negative. We need, I mean, this is all really an assault on free speech. This is an assault on, 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 on freedom, academic freedom. It's assault on our most basic rights concerning citizens. Uh, and these will be intensified unless people can link this crisis, this medical crisis, to a larger political crisis. It's sneaking in through the back door in the name of a language that's utterly militarized, that's utterly warlike. Remember, the language of war is about hypermasculinity. The language of war is about violence. The language of war is about turning safe spaces in, into, into surveillance spaces. There, there are no private safe spaces in, in the language of militarization. Public spaces don't exist. Everything is up for, for security grabs, so to speak. Uh, and if you look at what we see in China, uh, you know, and you look at what's going on in places like Brazil, all of a sudden as the crisis intensifies, the medical language becomes a more overtly militarized language, becomes the language of state repression. When you have in Brazil, police in helicopters shooting dissenters on the ground, claiming that this is all being done to in some way address the crisis and prevent things from spreading, or you have Trump uh, enabling not only leaders all over the world, but people in his own country to show up at rallies with assault rifles in, in the name of what? Freedom? No, this is in the name of repression. You know, repression always has a way of hiding in the shadows of a militarized language that allegedly is going to keep us safe because we're offered a choice and it's a bad choice. And it's a bad dichotomy. It's between security and freedom. Yeah, I, I also think that the consequences of, um, of, of, of talking in these terms is just getting us even more afraid all the time. I, I've been talking with, with friends of mine that 
uh, that, that had a family and kids. And uh, the other day, uh, a colleague told me um, if the digital technology with surveillance will give us the end of coronavirus, I will give all my data. I don't care anything. I just want uh, to me to have my life again back. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I think it, it, it's really complicated when, when you think about, um, about um, great populations and, and, and a lot of people and a lot of uh, data of that people, right? Because nowadays we are facing about, uh, well, Occident that we don't have this, um, this uh, phases of surveillance, but in the other side, we have China uh, with, with all the results that at least we see that they are controlling the pandemia. But at, at to what point, right? You were talking about uh, human rights. Where is our privacy human right? No? You know, it, it, it's really interesting because you know, the metaphor 1984 yeah. and, and Brave New World seems so intensely outdated today because the technology is so much more sophisticated. The state is so much more powerful. Uh, and yet what people will do in the name of a crisis, what they will give up by, by virtue of not having the language, by virtue of not realizing what the consequences will be after the crisis passes. Uh, and what they've lost. There are some things you can lose that you don't get back except through a revolution. You know, liberal democracy, so to speak, is not going to give those things back to you. Uh, but I think you hit something that I really like and, I, and I, I really appreciate, and that is think about how the concept of fear is translated and emphasized in this crisis. Fear becomes the fear of ourselves being infected. It's a personalized fear, right? But yeah, we, don't, yeah. we don't have a larger conception of fear, like the fear of poverty, the fear yeah, yeah. of dictatorships, you know, the, the, the fear that comes with oppression. That fear evaporates so that the, the, the public now collapses into the private. Fear becomes an utterly privatized issue. It's all about us individually. You know, I'll, I'll give up all the data to protect my family. Jesus, well, would you give up? What if, what if that you're giving up that data and thousands of people are going to go to jail who basically are seen as two left? How do you feel about that? But that's, that's, that means you have to be able to translate a private issue into a larger systemic public consideration. That's a form of civic literacy. As civic literacy dies in the midst of the, the massive spread of, of fake news, conspiracy theories, the elimination of the truth, the collapse of evidence, you have to ask yourself, you know, how important is language in all of this? And how important are the apparatuses that control it? That's part of the first question you asked me. That's part of the larger issue around how this medical crisis is also a political an ideological crisis because it's a crisis of language as well. Yes, it's interesting also to analyze uh, the role of the education in this whole process, you know. Um, I try to find a, a, a specific expression that you use in, your, in this article. And, okay, okay, it's here. For instance, it's been a central pedagogical principle of neoliberalist and individual responsibility is the only way to address social problems. And consequently, there is a no need to address broad system issues. Hold power accountable or embrace matter or collective responsibility. I, I, is, you know, uh, both together, we, we work in the educational field, you know, so, but when, when we read this expression, I don't know, how can we imagine other different role of the education, you know? Yeah. When the, the globalization is, is absolutely linked with the neoliberalism. I mean, I think there are three or four issues. How do you feel about this, you know? Well, I, I, I think that, you know, all of us find out, at the most immediate level, we all find ourselves in institutions that are marked by enormous contradictions and, and weigh heavily on the side of a neoliberal ethic, as, as we all know. That has to be fought. I mean, it has to be fought collectively. It has to be fought through our work. It has to be fought individually. 
Secondly, there's gotta be a resurrection in some fundamental way, not simply of the purpose and the meaning of, of, of the university, uh, which, which has to be aligned on the side of uh, democratic values, uh, to say the least, and, 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 and what it means to create informed citizens who can actually function in a democracy. But it, it, it seems to me that, that there's an enormous need to resurrect some conception of, of the humanities. You know, some conception of the humanities as something that runs across every discipline in the university, that connects them. How do we talk about the good life? How do we talk about justice? How do we educate young people in a way that they can, be, they can hold power accountable, that they can be actually not just simply market agents you know, or agents of the market, but actually can be democratic agents? How can they not be commodities? How do you get them to be more than commercials? You know, do I really have to wear underwear that says Calvin Klein on it? Do, do, does everything I put on have to have a, a logo on it that's an advertisement for some fucking corporation? I mean, do we really have to do that? Do we have to turn student unions into places where they buy, they get credit cards? So it seems to me at one level, that's part of our struggle. The second level is how do we function as public intellectuals collectively? not just individually, collectively. You know, how do we use each other's resources? How do we do it, what you're doing here? You know, begin to talk to each other to make a public statement, not to celebrate an isolated public intellectual, but to try to talk together to figure this stuff out. You know, what, what can we say to each other that would be helpful and function educatively for other people to hear? And how can we listen to them? Thirdly, how do we create educational spaces outside of the university that basically accounts for a way to offset what I call this new pandemic pedagogy? The pandemic pedagogy is the pedagogy of fear. It's the pedagogy of isolation. You know, it's the pedagogy of decoupling agency from any sense of social justice and collective resistance. That's what a pandemic pedagogy does. It operates off fear and isolation. So it seems to me these are questions that we have to investigate, particularly in a time of crisis. Because the other side of this is, look, neoliberalism has failed. And the curtain has been pulled away. It doesn't provide adequate health care. It doesn't give people the, the tools they need to fight pandemics. It makes most people poor. Most people can't afford a, a, a $400 bill in the United States, for instance, uh, that, uh, one month ahead of time. So the, the number of oppressed has widened in this crisis to such enormous proportions that it offers an enormously important pedagogical moment to begin to make the connection so that people can see, to go back to your first question again, Pablo, that this is not simply a medical crisis, that at its core, it's a political, ideological, and pedagogical crisis. Yeah, sure, Henry, I, I totally agree. I just I totally was, agree also. I, I, I was thinking, how do you see, and, and if you see that the, um, the youth, you know, if, if, if they have some key, if they have some answers that we, the adults, the teachers, we are not seen. And how oh, I, 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 I think that that's a fabulous question, by the way. Uh, it really is. Uh, I, I think the, probably the only hope we really have for the future is we have generations of young people who realize that the future has been canceled out for them. Not just in the most immediate notion of the crisis, but in the fact that they're, they're burdened with debt uh, they, have, they live in neoliberal universities that are not exciting, but are boring. They all don't want to be accountants and bankers. Uh, they recognize the deprivations around gender inequality and racism. And there are some that don't, of course. But when I, when I look at the way young people are making connections between climate change and neoliberalism, you know, the defunding of education, the collapse of the welfare state, I mean, these are really smart kids. I mean, they... They, really, they, they realize that, that uh, you know, I don't want to say my generation has failed them, and I'm much older than both of you, but I, but I, but I think in, in some ways they're, they're listening once again to intellectuals from that generation who really did see ahead. You know, they were minor, they were marginalized, 
but, but they're learning from themselves and they're learning from others. They're learning internationally from other youth in other countries. They're, they're all, they, they tend to be border crossers and they tend to have a wider understanding of problems than I, than I think an older generation does. And uh, I think we're gonna see a lot more, uh, believe me, a lot more protests, both nationally and internationally on the part of young people. Yeah. I, think it's very, I think it's very important to listen to them, very important to learn from them, and very important to be in dialogue with them, all three of those things. Yeah, totally. I, I add there that uh, I think that the, the, the huge challenge that we have is to create instances where we can really hear them and include their voices and their perceptions. But also, how do you see can, that can we teach um, criticism and collective resistance that I think that, uh, like you said, it's a little bit of, a, of their nature, but how can we in schools and universities uh, explode this, give them I, 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 look, yeah. I, I, I hate to put it this way, and I hope it doesn't sound simplistic, right? You gotta be brave. Yeah, you know? I have to be brave. Yeah. You gotta take risk. You got to teach stuff that the university hates. You know, you, you, you have to have students speak in class, have them write, give them literature that they, they ordinarily don't see. I teach a course uh, with arts and science young people who are really the best undergraduates in the university, very special program that I have, the, that I'm fortunate enough to teach one semester in. And they come in, and these kids are brilliant. I, I really mean that. They can write, they're smart, and I, we work through a language, and I must tell you, they're transformed. At the end, they're transformed. And that's what we have to do. I don't get awards for doing this. I mean, I get fired for doing this in universities. But th this is what we need to do. We need to mark out a space of resistance. We need to provide models for these kids that in some way makes it clear that you can't be involved and fight for, you, for, for justice unless you can take risk. You take risk, you take risk politically, you take risk epistemologically, you take risk intellectually, and you become a model. I, I mean, you, you, know, you say, look, this is what you do, it's not gonna be easy. You know, if you, if you wanna go through life being a banker and getting rewards, this is not for you. But yeah, take a chance, yeah. you know, learn to be compassionate. No, yeah, no, definitely. Sorry, uh, Bato, I, 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 I need to interrupt you because I was- No, 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 no problem, no problem, no problem. No, 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 and there's a phrase I, I, I used to use uh, that it's for um, an Argentinian um, writer that it's called Fabian Casas. I recommend you, Henry, because he's great. He always says, uh, says we don't have to be uh, politica, uh, politically correct, but we have to be political, politically concrete. Absolutely. We, we have to put the body uh, for the words that we we love to say because they are correct, right? I, I, think, I, I also think there's another way of saying that. We, we, can be theoretically, we can be theoretically insightful, but that doesn't mm. give us the right to be pedagogical terrorists. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, yeah, no, right. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I would like to know if you are optimistic or negative about the future now, because I'm always I, optimistic. I, I'm always optimistic. I, I, I don't believe you can be a radical and not be optimistic. How, how can you be a radical and not have hope? Because hope doesn't mean that you, you're, you're arguing from some, for some pie in the sky uh, position. Oh, it's going to be great. Don't worry. Hope means that you believe that another future is possible. Hope believes that it's worth struggling for, and, and regardless of the realities in which you find yourself. If you don't have hope, you become a cynic. If you don't have hope, you become complicitous. So for me to have hope is to say that I would fight for the rest of my life, for whatever time I have left, to make sure that I can do something to make this world a better place. Because it seems to me I have that obligation as a human being around human rights, around justice, around solidarity, around values that matter. Uh, that's what hope is. You know, hope is basically the engine of struggle. Without hope, there's no agency. Without agency, there's no hope. Mm -hmm. Definitely. But I, I would like to know if in this specific uh, situation that we are live with the pandemic, yeah. if you, do you think that 
this is an uh, opportunity to to be an uh, optimist on negative. I, I ask this because, for example, in the international intellectual deba debate, for example, um, some intellectual, as a Sisek, for example, is a very optimist because. No, no, he, I, 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 I've read what he's written recently, and actually, I agree with him. I actually okay. agree with him. I, I, I think the system has so decomposed in such a massive failure uh, at every level, from language to policy, the social relations, there is a space, let, let's, think about, let's think about Gramsci, right? You know, his notion of the interregnum? Yes. Yeah. You know, I mean, the old is dying, the new is emerging, and there's something called the historical conjuncture in the middle, where new political formations are emerging. And that's absolutely true at the moment. And that's why I would argue that the most crucial element to think about this crisis in terms of what it means to address it is a pedagogical question. How do you change consciousness? How do you produce new narratives? How do you create a language that pe in which people can recognize themselves? How do you merge passion and understanding? How do you get beyond the jargon? How do you broaden audiences? How do you recognize diverse audiences? How do you do all this? This is a very important question. And it should be a conference we should have. In Buenos Aires, we should have a conference on this. I mean, how do we want to now imagine this crisis in pedagogical terms? What responsibilities does it demand? What intellectuals should we bring together? What borders should be crossed? What resources should be mobilized? Hmm. Yeah. We have uh, many reasons to mobilize them. Def yeah, definitely, I know. No, I am optimistic. I, I, I'm optimistic because I think it's a terrible time. And in the midst of a terrible time, there are always opportunities. There are opportunities. You can go one way or the other. There's no guarantees here because this is a political question. There are no guarantees. You believe they're guarantees, you're screwed. You know, you're done. You'll, you'll end up in jail somewhere. But if you believe you have to fight for those opportunities in ways that take advantage of the reality in which you find yourself, because resistance is always contextual. It's always contextual, right? You have to understand the forces that you're working in in ways to be able to speak to them, to move against them, and to challenge them, and to transform them. Yeah, Henry, and um, I think you will agree that we are facing two global problems right and that we need to address these solutions with global solutions right yeah. what which paths or, or or ways do you think that we need to build in order to have this um um yeah global responses how can we I, I, organize? I, I, I'll, I'll give you the easy answer and forgive yeah. me if it's too simple okay the greatest challenge that we face in terms of all these crises whether they're ecological the threat of nuclear war pandemics is the world is dominated by a system that's going to reject. Capitalism is not democracy. It's not democracy. And that system has to be named for what it is, a toxin, a poison. It's poisoning the globe. It's going to be challenged at every level, ideologically, politically, policy-wise, in terms of all the collective resistance we can muster. We have to find a thread that works through all of these issues that we're mentioning. And that thread basically is about the concentration of power and finance in relatively few hands, whether it's in China, whether it's in the Soviet, or in Russia, whether it's in the United States. This is all about authoritarianism linked to the politics of greed, you know, linked to the politics of finance and power. It's got to be changed. We have to imagine a collective imagination. We have to imagine what the social imagination looks like in light of envisioning a very different future rooted in elements of a democratic socialism. That's the fight. That's a major fight. Because if we don't eliminate that beast, it's not going to matter, you know? I mean, they'll just throw out simple answers. They'll say, oh, yeah, everybody should take out their garbage. You know, we're going to lower emissions a little bit. No, the system does not need to be reformed. It needs to be replaced. Mm. It needs to be replaced. We're not talking, reform is, we don't have time for reform. The glo I, I give it 10 years. In my estimation, we've got 10 years. We don't do it in 10 years, the end of humanity. It's over. 
It's over. <laughs> good. Sounds so good. Yeah, uh, um, I would like to ask you about the specific situation. It's the Tilian situation. You know, you know that a couple of months ago, uh, we have an important rev social revolution. But now with this pandemia or this uh, lockdown, uh, a lot of different actors of the movement say that Piñera, the president, current president, tried to take advantage of this uh, pandemic to control the movement um, with, with the fear, you know, with the risk. So um, the people, the actor of the movement try to ask if, if when we can return to the street because we need to save on our life because the government from the Chilean government have a similar strategy that the, the Trump uh, strategy, you know, it's, you know, it's always the same, you know, Chilean, the model of Chilean, uh, of Chilean is US. So uh, how we can return and with this social process? Uh, uh, was the, the situation that lived Chilean, Chile um, a month ago was so important, it was so historical. You, uh, we talked about this in Barcelona last year, you know. It, it was a very um, um, fantastic, fantastic process because a lot of, a million of people in Chile, not only people that give support to the revolution, also people that probably give support initially to Piñera, no? But millions of people believe that we can change everything that you, the, the same that you say a few minutes ago, you know. It's time to change the model, but now with the lockdown, and uh, the sensation, the perception of the people is that mm, maybe Piñera tried to, you know, take advantage with this. I hope no, we can I, return this. I, I mean, I think, I think we need to, we, we need to re-theorize the context in which we find ourselves without giving up the vision of mass protests and mass, mass change. I mean, the cruel reality is that people in large groups can actually kill each other, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the cruel reality of the moment. That that's, the cruel reality. that's the cruel reality. So the question that we have to ask is what, how can protests continue without these massive demonstrations? And what does it look like? Does it look like a massive educational campaign online? Does it look like people uh, uh, working with other people in ways that information can be distributed? Does it mean a massive expansion of, of a, uh, an alternative media system in every way that we can think about it? I mean, that space has to be occupied until the crisis is over. At the same time, people have to be reminded that in the name of the crisis, the protests are being repressed, mm. that they're being repressed, that this is not just a medical crisis, this is a political crisis. And that what do we do to separate the political medical crisis from the political crisis, i.e., don't do anything that would endanger other people's lives, but make it clear that this endemic is a pandemic is worse and could get worse and could seep into a form of neoliberal fascism if we don't somehow keep the protest alive and as soon as it's safe, take to the streets. So we're not saying we shouldn't be protesting in the streets. We're saying, let's wait until we can do it. Let's mm -hmm. be calm, let's organize. In the moment that this is possible, everything should be in place to shut the state down shut it down, right? Just shut it down. <laughs> yeah, um, Henry, um, when we were preparing this interview, I, 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 I really wanted to, to make um, a, a question. I, I asked Pablo and he, he told me, yeah, just let it go. I, it's a, a little game, but as you were a friend and a colleague of, of, of Pablo Freire, what do you think that he will feel and, and which ideas do you think he will have in, in this crisis? I, I will guess that very similar to you, but uh, just to play this little game. You mean um, Paulo, Paulo Freire? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I, I think Paulo, I mean, look, Paulo believed that the question of agency was central to the question of resistance, to the question of justice, right? And he believed that education was central to politics. And I think that what Paolo would say is what this crisis makes clear is that education is more central to politics than we have ever seen before, because we're at a turning point in history. The, the system works politically and it works ideologically. It silences people. It, 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 up, it, up, 
it undoes their sense of agency, so to speak. And now we have to fight back in the midst of this crisis to regain that sense of agency. And that's an educational project. And we have to theorize how that project will unfold in a set of circumstances that are more pressing than anything we've ever seen before. This is worse than a, an overt dictatorship because it has the power to so isolate people in the name of a medical crisis, in the name of the fear of death. You know, in the past, we, we had the fear about going to jail or about being tortured or about, about being, you know, interrogated. This is about the fear of death. You could die, right? Yeah, and yeah. all of a sudden, as you had said earlier, this collective sense of fear is being mobilized, a sense of collective fear is being mobilized in ways that are both undoing the possibility of politics, emptying it out of any substance, and at the same time convincing people that once this is over, nothing will change. That has to be fought. Politics has to be re-inhabited, re-theorized, education has to become central to politics, and the question of protest has to in some way take a different form until we can resume and find ourselves in a space where we can actually protest as we have in the past. Massive demonstrations, massive organizations, and so forth and so on. I don't think, I, I, I think, I think Paolo would have been uh, actually, he, he, would have, he would have been overjoyed by some of this uh, because I don't, think, I, I don't think he would have ever imagined a crisis of such proportions that it closes down the global economy and opens up a space for holding power accountable on a global level, not just in particularly Thank oppressive you. dictatorships. You know. yeah. Okay, Henry, um, I would like to thank for you this position to talk with us. And uh, was all like uh, every moment uh, was an inspiration to us to, to hear you. So thank you very much for this. A minute with us, and I would like to know only one. One, uh, I, I would like to ask you only one. Like the last question, you know, what do you think that is the um, the, the the challenge? For example, well, the most important challenge that uh, the educational, the formal educational system have now. You know, in, in Spain, for example, and in Chile, on some countries like Paraguay, for example, recently, last week ago, the the face to face. Is, uh, classes was cancelled in April in second month of the year, for example. This is amazing because it's a increase the inequality in uh, uh, compared to with other country. And in Spain, we 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 now uh, the debate is how we can start on when we will we'll start the uh, the new year uh, of the academic you know year the, uh, next September only with 15 uh, students per per classroom or by online, educa only online education. Um, the, the research probably will be, um, uh, will be canceled for a, a some period. I don't know, what is your perception about the future of the university of the school in, in, the, next, in the next, for the next course, for the next year? I, I think that what the university needs to do is, is to rethink uh, itself beyond simply instrumental strategic questions about opening up. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think this is a purely technical question. I think the university needs to say, okay, how have we become complicit with this pandemic? You know, and what, what, you know, education is not just what you learn, it's what you leave out. And it's also not about what has to be learned, it's about what has to be unlearned. And I think the question that they have to face is what has to be unlearned? in terms of our history and our past in the last 40 years, to make sure a pandemic never happens like this again, to make sure that students are prepared to basically deal with the ideological and political forces at work that made this pandemic so terrible. What does it mean to invite, invigorate education in ways that empowers people to be citizens, engage critical citizens in a world without uh, having allegiance to simply one country? to be global citizens. I mean, this is a challenge. And I think that when we start talking about whether we're gonna use Zoom or whether we're gonna have online classes or we're just gonna have slowly bring people back into the classroom, it completely misses the point. That's a neoliberal argument. 
It's not because it isn't important, it's a neoliberal argument because of what it leaves out. I completely agree, yes. Yeah. Okay, is this gonna, is this gonna be online, this interview? This is going to be online, yeah. Okay, will you send me a <laughs> copy when it's online? Of course, of course. Yeah, we'll definitely. You a copy. Henry, just the last one and we stop uh, recording. Is there something that you start doing in this um, in this shutdown that you want to maintain when we go back to normality? Something of your diary. It's an individual question. We are always asking to the. I, I, I want to fight. I want to fight harder. Fight harder. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Henry, thank you very much for everything. <laughs> we got to learn uh, a lot of, of, of this chat. Thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for doing it, really.